What do you think separates the top 1% of data scientists from another? Who can ask the best questions? Being able to ask really insightful questions and to constantly think about what we aren't seeing in the data or what additional data sources we need to capture. That is the that is the uniquely human thing that, that I think separates the best data scientists and the best product leads to, honestly. So you've worked at Microsoft, you've worked at Google, you've worked at GitHub. Uh, what's your career optimization function and how has it changed over time? I always like to go where I feel like I will learn the most. So go to the company that is doing the thing that you want to learn how to do the best. How do you end up foreseeing Gen AI for code generation actually rolling out in enterprises? I can, I can tell you a little bit about how we're thinking about it for Alphabet and then also talk a little bit about the, uh, the Duet AI features that recently got announced at Cloud Next. How nervous is everyone when they kick off a big pre-training run? I've, I've wondered oh, that. Man. <laughs> like, it's like, I personally, like, butterflies in my stomach all the time. I, I think the, and there's something magical about working as part of a small team, you know? Like, it, it's, you know, you feel very close to each other. Um, you feel like you have like a, a, a mission, um, so so it's it's just good. Yeah, and I, I think a lot less people will get fired in the whole startup yeah. cycle. I don't think we ever really say goodbye, right? Like because mm. the cause the uh, this community is so dang small. Like, I still talk to there. There are some team members who I had at GitHub that I still talk to every week or every couple of weeks. Oh, that's cool. Um, yeah, there are team members I had at Microsoft that, you know, like I see on Facebook every single day or Twitter every single day um, and feel like I, I know more about their lives than than my family probably knows about mine, unfortunately. What do you think are some best practices for folks wanting to do fine tuning and instruction tuning? So, so definitely, I, I think that you can move the needle significantly for for a lot of domain specific use cases. Um, and I think it, it also opens up the door for many domain experts. All right, so my first question is, so you're the lead product manager for generative models at Google DeepMind. You're working on Code AI, Palm 2, and Gemini. Can you tell us more about what you do? Yeah, absolutely. So I am um, I am a product lead for, uh, for Google DeepMind, which is a new organization that Alphabet just recently created, Merging Brain, um, which was previously part of Google Research with DeepMind, which is a company that was founded by Demis Hassabis and team. Um, it's been a, a wild ride to see it kind of coalesce into a, a single team. And it's been really exciting for all of the researchers and engineers involved. Um, I, I think many of them are jazzed to, to just be able to collaborate freely as opposed to having these like weird artificial company barriers. Mm -hmm. um, so that's been, that's been super exciting. And at GDM, I own Code AI, which is machine learning as applied to the end-to-end -end software development lifecycle. Um, so everything from code generation to code explanation to um, kind of performance recommendations, storage optimization, um, and then also things like generating code behind the scenes to, to run robots or to, um, to navigate web pages or, or any of these things. Um, and all of these, uh, all of these kinds of capabilities are leveraging, you know, large language models. Um, so I was also helping out with Palm 2 um, when Palm 2 got announced at I.O. and then integrated into many products and features um, and helping out with Gemini, which is our next generation uh, large language model. So I was the product lead for Palm 2 and then I'm one of the PMs involved with Gemini. Very cool. And yeah. how long? Gemini is multimodal, correct? Yes, suppose, Gemini is multimodal be... from day zero. From yeah. day zero. Okay, so I have an interesting yeah. question on that coming up. Um, what would you say to someone when they say this whole LLM thing is a fad? Well, I, I think that's a so so. I would really love to to understand what they mean by that first off, because I, I do think that what we're seeing today is a push towards building larger and larger and larger models and to push the boundaries of capabilities. But I also feel like the the way that the models are being used most is through smaller variants. Mm -hmm. So not necessarily the models on the order of a trillion parameters or hundreds, billions of parameters, but the ones that are a little bit more modest. So on the order of 20 or 30 billion parameters that can fit on a single GPU um, or like a small number of GPUs and be used very efficiently for inference. 
Um, so, so I would love, uh, I would love to, to kind of unpack that, that statement. Um, cause I, I do personally agree that the, the most bang for the buck that we're going to see from large models isn't necessarily like the big guys that, you know, are, are the ones that, that are very expensive and very energy intensive to do inference on. Mm -hmm. Um, but the ones that are, um, you know, still very capable, getting more capable every day, but can be efficiently run at scale by lots of different applications, lots of different companies. Um, we even announced just recently um, the Android team uh, mentioned that they're going to be uh, putting a large model on mobile devices. Huh. Um, so embedding it as part of the operating system um, to, to make it so that everybody has a hyper-personalized assistant um, on their Android phone, uh, which is pretty cool. That is very exciting. And so, so it's, yeah. And so, so that's like, so, so I can kind of buy like, all right, well, maybe large models uh, and like getting super, super obsessed with large models is fad, but you can also have like baby large language models that are, you know, on the order of one to 2 billion parameters that can be embedded all over the place. Um, hmm. so. so to some degree, I have one on my phone. And then as you think about, you know, things like you're responsible for, for integrating very large language models across a disparate number of applications, let's say all across Google and, you know, folks at Microsoft, they do the same thing. Yeah. And I guess now Anthropic with AWS, that could be interesting. Um, yeah. Large language, very large language models probably work better in that setting where it's so many different types of information yeah. and personas coming in versus, let's say, a smaller model? What's your thoughts there? That's a great question to ask. I feel like it also might make sense on these like one and done tasks. Mm -hmm. So so an example of this would be, um, you know, brownfield sort of maintenance activities for software. Um, things like migrating from one framework to another or migrating from one variant of SQL to another, um, like maybe from Oracle SQL to something that's an open source flavor of SQL mm -hmm. or, um, yeah, or, or like explaining, um, uh, you know, creating explanations for different files within a legacy code base or, uh, <laughs> you know, or like storage optimization or performance recommendations for how software should be changed to make it, you know, more efficient to run at scale across a fleet. All of these are, um, you know, things that don't happen like once a minute every day yes. sort of tasks. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, in which case I could totally see, um, you know, maybe a, a much larger model with more capabilities um, long context, you know, you feed it in a repo, it makes the changes once, um, and then you're, you're kind of off to the races. Um, but if it, if it is something like, you know, you're, you're getting, uh, you're having a, a conversation with a chatbot on your phone, right. um, and you, you expect to get back responses with relatively little latency, um, uh, you know, like, uh, conversational style approaches doesn't necessarily need like the absolute definite, um, 100% accurate, uh, uh, output, then smaller models make the most sense. Makes sense. Makes um, sense. Mm -hmm. What would you say are the advantages of training a multimodal model versus a text model? And you know, beyond that question, does a multimodal Multimodal model have <laughs> less textual understanding because it's technically seeing less text. Yeah, so so that's the it's, multimodal model is is definitely a tongue twister. Yeah. Like the, <laughs> um, the so so relatedly, um, there is there are a couple of flavors of Palm two that were made to be multimodal. So they used the Palm two model as kind of this text backbone. Mm -hmm. And then they introduced the multimodal uh, capabilities on top. So an example of this would be Palm E, um, which is used to operate robots. Um, so you might have an input video feed, you might have a natural language request, and then the little robot dude can kind of go and navigate and like acquire the apples and bring them back to you or whatever it might be. Yes. Um, yep. And so, so I think that's one of the the unique eye openers for me in terms of multimodal capabilities. You know, as humans, we experience the world in a multimodal way. You know, we hear things, we 
we hear language, we, we see things outside, you know, and, and in order to do all of the things that are interesting in our lives, you know, it requires that multimodal sense. It's not just text. It's not just code. Um, and so when you do introduce multimodal work, um, so say in, as, as an example in the code AI space, you can have a screenshot of a UI or, you know, sketch out a website on a napkin or whatever it might be. Um, send it to the model and then have the model generate corresponding code, natural language descriptions. Um, you can ask uh, the model to give you recommendations of how to make your website design more accessible um, or, or, you know, more attractive, like whatever it might be. Um, you can ask the model to create game assets. So, so like uh, little 8-bit characters mm -hmm. that you could incorporate into a video game. Um, so the, the possibilities are really endless. Um, and, and I do think that as an industry, we're going to increasingly be moving more into the world of multimodal models. Yes. Um, and it doesn't compromise your capabilities for text usually. Um, it's just kind of opening the door to, to even more interesting questions that you can ask. Okay, that's cool. Um, how do you end up foreseeing Gen AI for code generation actually rolling out in enterprises? Because I'm sure everyone, oftentimes source code is a big, uh, that's a big differentiator across many different companies. And how do you sort of see it actually rolling out in enterprise? I can, I can tell you a little bit about how we're thinking about it for Alphabet. Okay. Um, and then also talk a little bit about the, uh, the Duet AI features that recently got announced at Cloud Next. Um, so, so for Alphabet, we've been doing, uh, we've been doing code AI related work for a long time. Hmm. Um, we have this massive corpus internally, something on the order of like 25 years of software engineering telemetry. Um, so everything from, you know, somebody files bug to, uh, they open up a Sitsi workspace and start trying to debug it. Um, to, you know, they, they pull in a library, they, they go and look up documentation, they go and get a snack, like all of these different things. Um, and the, uh, and, and since these models are based on large language models, but have continued pre-training with alphabet source code, um, we, we are very thoughtful about, um, kind of making sure that, uh, you know, if, if there's any code that like a code snippet that we use for completion mm -hmm. that might have been recited from a GitHub repository. Um, cause, cause at the end of the day, these models are just next token predictors, yes. right? Um, you can easily search against a corpus using like bloom filter, like approaches to see if the, um, to see if the, the snippet matches up. Um, and so if we do generate such code, then there's a pointer back to the GitHub repo um, to say like, hey, you know, you might want to take a look at this, like make sure the license is okay. And then also they might have already implemented the same function that you want. Um, and so, so that's how we feel about code completions, code generation. Um, you know, there's obviously, you know, things like code explanation and um, smart paste features or smart paste mentality uh, sort of features or um, automated debugging or performance recommendations or automated code review. So, so you submit a PR or a CL as we call them at Google, um, your reviewer might make some comments or have comments suggested for them to make by, um, by a large language model. Um, and then you as the person who initially submitted the code, all you have to do is click okay. And then that change is automatically accepted. Um, but there is a lot of thoughtfulness about um, you know, you definitely need to have the data that's unique to your company. You definitely need to be mindful about um, if you are reciting code from an external repo, um, a, correctly like attributing that work back to the original mm -hmm. author um, and, and informing the software engineer as opposed to them just kind of blindly accepting whatever they see. It's a hard, very hard problem yeah. to solve on, on the way over to, I was driving here and I was like, oh, I wonder what... What tokenization looks like for code versus, let's say, other types of text. Do you have any insights there? Um, there, there is there are different tokenization approaches. 
Um, and so, so this uh, and, and different considerations that you need to have when introducing these data sets into the model pre-training process or even kind of instruction tuning phases. Um, another example of how code and text are different, right, is that uh, is that, you know, you might want to be able to do completions like fill in the middle approaches for code. Um, that you wouldn't necessarily want to do for first sentence level That's fair. Um, mm -hmm. sentence level work. Um, and then there you also need to do different treatments for data like like say you're slurping in a whole bunch of technical blog posts or forum posts. Um, uh, and and I if you if you can't tell like I'm really I'm really in love with this question about data for pre-training models. Yes. I think it's one of the the trickiest things for companies to tackle and there are some who have devoted, a lot of care and attention to, to data pre-training mixes. Um, and you can see it in terms of their model capabilities. But like technical blog posts, you can you can slurp them in. Usually they're a combination of like text and then you know maybe an image, then also you know a code snippet, then maybe some more text, maybe some other things. Um, so being able to to have different treatments for each of those multimodal capabilities is really important. Um, and to also being able to extract the code snippets um, and correctly label them, because if you're if you're getting them from you know a place like GitHub or GitLab, they probably have like a .py extension at the very end, which means you can assume they're Python or some flavor of Python. You might have some insights into their dependencies, but if it's just a blog post, um, you kind of have to. Uh, be a, be clever about uh, figuring out which language is being used for the thing. Hmm. Um, so so it's it's super it's super fascinating. Um, and you know even though I, I think externally there's this impression of just like well you just vacuum up all of the things that you see on the internet and then boom like sentience or whatever. <laughs> um, like the the fact of the matter is that that's not uh, anywhere close to where where we are today. Mm -hmm. Can you describe that problem for the audience of training data mixtures and how that affects downstream performance? Absolutely. So one of the things um, I get the question a lot of, what does it mean to be a PM for a large model? Hmm. Um, and, and part of what it entails is uh, being able to kind of do exhaustive data analysis on the different use cases that you see in the wild. Mm -hmm. So this is a combination of looking at logs from APIs, um, different uh, kinds of ways that people are, are describing that they're using the model. Um, um, feel uh, the at the end of the day, it feels a lot like data science um, to get this composition of use cases and the uh, sort of percentages of these use cases across a broad swath of fields. So, so for code, as an example, um, you. You would look across, uh, you know, maybe the deployments in Colab and all of these Duet AI features and Android Studio and all of our internal teams with their with their products. And, you know, like maybe Kaggle is interested in introducing it into their kernels and all of these other places. Um, you would uh, see like, OK, well, 80 percent of these use cases care about code completions and of the of the use cases that care about code completions, it's majority Python and JavaScript. Mm -hmm. And so based on that distribution of use cases, you can say, OK, well, we have to have data within the model that supports all of them. Um, so for these edit, uh, for these these problems about editing, like code review, um, you would need to have code review data. Uh, so you couldn't just have like static files. You would probably need to have things like code diffs. Mm -hmm. um, and you would need to have things like um, uh, uh, the, the titles for, for the commits that you push, you might need to have PR descriptions, like all of these other bits and pieces, um, that you wouldn't have great context in if you, if you didn't have that as part of the pre-training mix. And then you would also need to have a corresponding eval. So a way to kind of test that the model is doing what it's intending to do. Um, and you would need to think about kind of the composition as well of your instruction tuning mix which is basically like um, uh, you can, it's an imperfect analogy, but you can think of pre-training as kind of like, you know, you growing up, going to school, getting educated, reading a whole bunch of books um, in your life, like leading up to going to university. Um, 
And then the the eval is kind of like the SAT, right? Which is, and, and I, I hate standardized tests because I don't think that they're a great measure of any person's, mm-hmm. you know, ability to do a thing. And I also have a lot of uh, similar feels about evals, but just think about an eval as like a standardized test. And then the instruction tuning mix is like you cramming the night before to try to, to figure out what is needed for the eval to like solve the problem. I see. Um, yeah. So, so I have a lot of, I have a lot of love for the pre-training data mixture. I think instruction tuning can get you boosts in some kind of performances, especially related to the eval set. Um, but for the most part, like the evals are not going to be giving you a full picture of how models are performing. It's very interesting that I don't think many people appreciate how probably hard it is to construct the training data set, construct an effective eval, and then release it into the wild to people who are just going to do random things to it, but also not corrupt both the training data set and have that leakage inside of the eval to make you think yeah. you're doing great things, but you're not. Exactly. And, and the, there's been so much, uh, you know, just accidental days data poisoning for pre-training mixtures for a lot of these open source and proprietary models. Um, so human eval and MBPP being two of the best, most well-known examples. Um, but you know, the, if you, if you put an eval out into the world, chances are, it's probably going to be copied into a whole bunch of different websites hmm. and there's no way to 100%, you know, uh, exclude it from all of those websites. Yeah. Huh. How do you yeah. know if you have good training data? That's a great question. So that, and it, and it's still an unsolved science, I would say, like even the proportions of training data mixtures. Um, so like how much code should you include? How much does code quality mm-hmm. impact performance? Um, are there some uh, programming languages that are better than others in terms of uh, in terms of giving the model insights about about code performance? Do uh, does including more code data, math data, science data, textbook like data um, help performance for other kinds of natural language tasks? Um, uh, all of these questions are, are really you know fields of fields of research unto themselves. Um, and still don't have great answers, which is, which is very inspiring. Um, it's good market. I think you can, yeah. And, and so I think you can do something, um, uh, you can do some clever things like, uh, try to run data ablations, which is, is just a way of saying like, um, okay, well, if I, like, I'm going to run a small experiment, I'm going to take a very small version of this model. I'm going to do some continued pre-training using this other data set. And let's see if the numbers on this eval go up. Like, and so, so I can kind of prove to myself and to my colleagues that incorporating these data um, is helpful for, for the kinds of things that we want to test. Um, but for the most part, that's, that's all it is, is like people have hunches to the effect of, well, we think that getting higher quality data will have significant impact. We don't know. We think that when the data is introduced in the model pre-training process, um, will, uh, like some sort of curriculum learning will have, um, positive downstream effects, but we don't know. We think incorporating this new kind of data will have positive effects, but we don't know. Um, and so just showing empirical evidence is a good way to, to prove to yourself and, and to your team. How nervous is everyone when they kick off a big pre-training run? I've, I've wondered oh, that. <laughs> like it's like... I personally like butterflies in my stomach all the time. I, I think the, and it, it also depends on the scale of the pre-training runs, mm-hmm. you know, like if you're, if I, this is something that's on the order of hundreds, millions of dollars, like obviously people, people feel very nervous. I think, um, there's also the, the constant uh, there, there's, there's often a misperception. I think that when you kick off the run, you just kind of like, all right, cool. Let's just go and like have fun for the next three months. When the reality is that you have to be constantly baby monitoring the thing mm-hmm. um, to make sure that it's actually doing what you expect it to do. Yep. Um, and there are often instances where you have to stop, roll back to another, Check like a point. previous checkpoint mm-hmm. and then kick it off again. And so, so this happens 
Um, this happens way more often than I than I think most people appreciate. And and for for the models we trained in Alphabet, as an example, we have people on kind of like like baby watch duty round the clock to make sure that if if the job you know something's wrong, then we can stop it, roll back, and restart. Mm-hmm. Is this like a nuclear bomb thing where they're like multiple people kick off the training script? So they're like, okay, you could figure this thing correct. Okay. I think it's correct. And like five people are responsible for checking versus like one guy or one woman just. I think it's a lot more than just like five (laughs) people, but it's the, it is very much like, you know, one person might initially write it, but then there are a whole bunch of other people who are like looking it over making sure everything is correct. Um, and then like one person does hit the, the, uh, you know, does hit the start button. Um, but there are a lot of other people who went into making sure that we're starting something that is actually, that actually makes sense. Cool. Yeah. I have a friend yeah. at work. He, so he works for, he works at one of the universities and they have a big cluster. So he kicks, he kicks off some pretty big training runs. And I'm, I always wonder yeah. like, what does that feel like to kick off a training run on a couple of thousand GPUs? Yeah. It's very different, obviously at your scale and, and, yeah. and hyperscaler scale, but I'm um, like, yeah. you know, that's kind of, I wonder if you go to bed that night, you're like, wow, did I do everything? Yeah. I, do? I imagine like, I've never driven a very expensive car, like a Ferrari or anything. And I don't really, I don't have a, uh, I don't necessarily have a desire to mostly because I would be afraid that I would wreck it and this, and then would feel very bad about that. Um, but I have similar sort of feels about large language model runs. Um, I am happy to not have that responsibility. Um, just because like, if you, if you make a wrong choice, like it's, it's a very expensive wrong choice. Okay. So you had mentioned in an interview about fine tuning and instruction tuning. It's, it's, very beneficial to help maybe some of the inconsistencies that happen during pre-training. What do you think are some best practices for folks wanting to do fine tuning and instruction tuning? So, so definitely I, I think that you can move the needle significantly for, for a lot of domain specific use cases. Um, and I think it, it also opens up the door for many domain experts to kind of prove that the, that the data sets and the use cases that they care about most are worthy of being incorporated into pre-training data mixtures. Hmm. Um, you know, the uh, using code as an example, um, I think this is also really, really beneficial in terms of showing how much data quality um, can improve model training. Um, so, so being a little bit more mindful about Maybe you're using execution feedback, or maybe you do some additional pre-processing steps, um, but then suddenly you see a, a much better performance on downstream Python use cases because of those because of those exercises. Um, so, so definitely care and put a lot of attention into your data sources. Um, put a lot of attention into um, the kinds of use cases that you're expecting for people to be doing to kick the tires on the model. Um, and I, I think it's also helpful in the sense that, um, you know, for the pre-training runs, they take a long time. They're very expensive for these fine tuning, uh, continued pre-training and instruction tuning steps, um, much less expensive. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and you can also see very, very significant results that can, that can help your business. So in the cases of like the 13 billion, the 70 billion parameter models that are open yep. source, let's say. When do you think it makes sense for someone to redo a training run on one of those? So, so I think, uh, I, I think it would make sense. Like, so say, um, say you were testing out the, the recent, uh, just to give them a plug, the Mistral 7D model, yeah, yeah. That, was, that was pretty um, cool. which, which they're doing pretty good on. Like it's, you know, I was very proud of the guys, like three months and having a model that performs pretty well is, is pretty, uh, it's pretty impressive. Um, but say you're, you're testing it out and it's just not where it needs to be for SQL performance or for mm-hmm. Java performance, or, or maybe you have, uh, you know, requirements around responsible AI features that maybe weren't part of the model. Um, and so, so I think it would make sense for you to, to invest the time and the compute required to get the data into a state where it needs to be, um, to uh, kind of do the additional continued pre-training and then to, to polish it a bit for your use cases. Hmm. Um, and I think that that's, um, 
it's also beneficial in the sense that this still gives people the opportunity to create curated experiences that are unique to them, to their businesses and their users, as opposed to, you know, we're, we're at the point where large language models, generative models are, are effectively commodity. Yeah. Right. Like, like there's so many out there that are doing pretty great, you know, like in there and they might be open source, they might be proprietary, um, but they're all, you know, doing more or less the same things with more or less comparable performance. Right. Um, and so, so anywhere that you can, you can differentiate, I think is a, is a thing that you should care about if you're a startup or, or you're a small business owner. So you work a lot with code generation and <clears throat> large yes. language models for um, doing different tasks in the coding. I, I would, I would almost say obsessive. Like you, it's, I am, yeah. I am obsessed with, I, I am obsessed with generative models as applied to machine learning tasks or uh, applied to software development tasks. Why is rather. that? Yeah. I, well, I think you know, and you and you probably feel this very much too. Like there's, there's this challenge with, um, you know people who want to build things like we, we all love, uh, we all love, you know, tinkering with, uh, tinkering with tools or, or building software or, you know, having an idea and then seeing it out there, mm -hmm. like, like seeing it actually exist. It feels very cool, um, to, to, you know, be able to imagine something and then actually have it, um, in a place where you can see it and also share it with all your friends. Yes. Um, but yeah, and there, but there's so much friction required between like having this idea in your brain to actually getting it out in the world. Mm -hmm. Like you, you don't know where to find the documentation. There's all this like drudgery with getting environments into a correct state. If you're working with Python environments, um, there's peculiarities with, um, you know, like launching compute or storage on cloud infrastructure. Um, and all of them have different names and all of them have impossible to navigate consoles. Um, and, and so, so all of these, all of these problems are things that you should not have to care a fig about, mm -hmm. um, and the, on the path to like actually creating something and expressing yourself um, in that. Um, exactly. Like it's, it's like, you know, artists, if every minute that they spend learning how to use Photoshop to like do a thing is, is a minute that they're not spending, like actually doing the thing that they love. Um, and so, so just personally, I feel like one of the, the most, the most impactful ways that I can spend my time is reducing this friction from having an idea to seeing it implemented mm -hmm. um, and helping people feel like they have more good days when they go to work. Um, so they're not wrangling with all these infrastructure and platform problems. They're actually, you know, shipping code that, that will do something that, that, uh, that's useful or um, like writing code that, that makes them joyful that they're writing it. Yeah. Well, they just ship five more products and in the same amount of yeah. time on, yeah. And they don't have to spend as many cycles maintaining those things over time either. Cause nobody likes doing maintenance. Like nobody likes migrations. That's why so many migrations are just effectively rewrites of entire code bases because nobody wants to spend the time migrating from one thing to another. Hmm. So, so as much pain as you can take away from the software development process, I think that like just makes people's lives better. And I am a fan of making people's lives better. Developers deserve nice things. Yeah. I think it would be interesting so like my dad was coding when he was really young and then he stopped coding for a long while. Mm -hmm. And now he's like, yeah, he came to the conference and he got all excited. He's like, mm -hmm. I'm seeing all these people I coding. Yeah, he, yeah. Was very, he was very sweet. He had great questions. Yeah. He's but, uh, you know, he's, he's a very special guy. Um, but one thing that yeah. gets me excited is like, oh, he could ship code and build things that he's wanted to build for a long time. And I think yeah. that's such an important mission just, just because I, as maybe as we look back at our lives, our, our, those joyful moments come from things that we create, we create, right? Okay. Creating a human is like yeah. one of the ultimate creations. That's a different story, yeah. but everything else is like, what did I achieve? What did mm -hmm. I sort of bring, bring into reality? So it's, it's a beautiful mission that you're on. Yep. Absolutely. Um, what do you, so in line with that around code generation, I imagine every single business will want to maybe have their own, type of model. It could be a variant of some of the big ones that are out there. 
Uh, what steps can those companies start making to make sure that their internal code bases are ready for, let's say, fine tuning or adapting through these services? That's a great question. So I, I feel like um, certainly getting uh, getting your code kind of cleaned up um, and, and investigating mm-hmm. some of the, the different API offerings that, that support fine tuning. Um, so Duet AI is one of these. Mm-hmm. Uh, GPT-4 is one. Um, I keep hoping, like, fingers crossed that Cloud2 uh, offers a fine-tuning API. Um, but but I think even more importantly, like, a, a stopgap thing that would, doesn't require any sort of, uh, you know, customization or fine-tuning at all is just leveraging long context. Hmm. Um, and so, so there are long context and retrieval techniques that you can do to make it feel like a model is generating code that is unique to yourself and your business unit. Um, but it is really just, uh, you know, being clever about including things as, as part of the prompt. So if you have like a, a standards handbook um, for the way that you should be authoring C++ or something similar, or you have a proprietary variant of a uh, SQL, um, that, you know, maybe has 15 pages of documentation. Um, if you have a model with a hundred K or more context window, Mm -hmm. um, and Claude as an example, you know, supports 200 K, um, not, not super well. Um, but like, I think they only guarantee up to a hundred K, but you can put a whole bunch of stuff in the context. Um, that's 400 pages thereabouts of like a novel, right? Like, so you, you could effectively say like, all right, well, uh, Hey model, um, you're, you're generating our proprietary version of SQL. Now here's the API reference, everything that you would need to know. Um, here's another, you know, bit of standard, uh, that we, that we employ as a company now generate the code. Um, and it would be capable of doing such things. Do you think software engineers will become senior and like level five software engineers faster because of this technology? Definitely. That's what, that's what we've, um, so, well, so, so I guess, uh, I've seen studies from Copilot and we've run similar studies internally showing that the people who are benefited most are kind of the, the L5 minus squeeze. Mm-hmm. Um, so the ones who are, who don't know where to find the documentation and they don't know what library they should be using. Yes. And they haven't really learned the company standards for Python or for C++ or whatever it might be. Um, there are some like expert level programmers, as an example, like uh, like Jeff or Sanjay at Google or, um, you know, like some of, some of the others that are like world-class leaders in authoring code. Um, who oftentimes I see them turn recommendations off because they're just like, well, I just want to think, you know, like mm-hmm. I already know what I need to build. Like I just want to build it. Um, those sorts of things, unless they're writing boilerplate, in which case like they really appreciate <laughs> having something else like write the boilerplate. Okay. Um, yeah. But I, I do think that like anybody who's a non world-class expert um, will have benefits from from using these tools we just have to keep them getting better and better yeah i secretly want to become a a very hardcore software engineer i admire them quite quite a lot just because i I think their ability to create is what i maybe truly want and and they just do it like that and they can see things that you don't see if you're not at their level so it's a beautiful thing okay so i'll be i'll be level five next year i'm I'm ready (laughs) excellent there's a there's a um, there's a story. I think it was part of a New York Times story um, about Jeff and Sanjay, and they were trying to debug something, and they ended up like having to look at. I don't know if it was binary code or if it was something else, but they were like looking at the zeros and ones and like weird digits that that correspond with the code, and that like that's where they found the bug. Um, and all I could think was just like, that's great. Y'all are like next level. I don't want to have to even think about doing mm-hmm. that. And I wouldn't even know where to start, honestly. Yes. Like like my my expertise in debugging is um, you, I can do it at the Python layer. I can do it sometimes at like the XLA C++ layers, but I do not want to have to go anywhere like lower than that. Like it would just not make me happy. Yeah, like, they seem like wizards sometimes yeah. just to be able to, yeah. to think on a level. Cool. Yeah. Um, 
so more for not necessarily the users, I would say people that run companies, what should data leader, excuse me, data leaders be thinking about given all of these LLM advancements and how do they start to prepare themselves for driving that type of adoption within their enterprise? Like considering different representations of data. Mm -hmm. So not just, um, not just a kind of, considering the job done to have, you know, Python files put in, uh, put in a repository, but considering like, all right, well, it might be meaningful to have a join of the commit message, the code diff, um, a higher level description of the commit message um, and some other things. I think a team that does this very well in the open source community and shows their work because it's open source is the Big Code Project. Hmm. Um, they have a collection of data sets. I believe they're called the Octopack data sets. Um, but they also have an example in that, in that series around fine-tuning data for code. Mm -hmm. um, and just to show, like, well, here's, here's how the pre-training data might look, which is a little bit of a, of a cleaned-up smorgasbord. Um, so you might do some deduplication, you might do some rudimentary filtering, and then for the fine tuning data, here's what that looks like. Well, that's nice. That's exciting. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, what, what factors would you say need to be in place in a small to medium enterprise for them to be successful on their Gen AI journey? And that Gen AI is slightly, uh, I think, more broad than text generation. What's your thoughts there? Yeah, I think everyone should should build a philosophy around do you want to try to build something in-house or do you first want to prototype with paid service APIs? Mm -hmm. um, my recommendation would always be prototype first with the paid service APIs just because the cost of maintaining your own systems over time can be really, really very expensive. Um, and not just from the perspective of needing to hire very expensive people to do the fine tuning and to serve it efficiently, but also like figuring out whatever incantations need to be in place to run it on cloud infrastructure. Um, it, it just ends up being a lot. And I, and I think sometimes people underestimate that cost. Mm -hmm. um, so, so that would be my, my first recommendation is if you have an idea and anybody can have an idea, like if you play with, if you play with, uh, you know, any of the generative AI tools that are out on the market today, like it's, it's pretty, it's pretty obvious to, that you can get started with just a prototype of an implementation pretty quickly. Um, just try it out, convince your business see what would need to happen in order for it to be economic. Um, and if it's a feature that if users even really enjoy using, um, and if they do and they do for long enough, then maybe it's, it's an opportunity to develop a team in house. But for the most part, um, like the APIs are going to be the best bet, especially for a small to medium sized company. Makes sense. How do I convince my yeah. boss to adopt Gen AI? Oh, wow. <laughs> so, so I think, from uh, something that's that's been compelling for for many businesses is this understanding that everybody else is adopting Gen AI, mm -hmm. like all the, all of their competitors are, um, and so and I'm always a fan of of just show the data. Um, so so if you do have competitors that are adopting it as part of their roadmaps, if you um, can kind of point towards areas that that take a lot of manpower to support currently. Um, that, that could be benefited by having a more streamlined approach that's enabled by generative AI. Um, those are all great bits of information that you can take to leadership to, to show. And in general, if you're, if you're coming to them saying like, hey, you know, pretty confident we can save money, pretty confident that we can do it in a reasonable manner. Like as, as an example, so when I started doing machine learning, super basic stuff, right? Like, like the most, the most, like this was 2009, 2010. So it was like classification tests, maybe a uh, linear regression, logistic regression, like decision trees, state of the art, like whatever it might've been. Um, these days, like you can prompt a large language model with like, all right, I have five categories of customer support requests. They're usually like people reporting defective hardware, people reporting like issues with software that are high level, people reporting issues with software that are low level um, uh, or like foobar bats, whatever it might be. 
um, hey, language model, like here's a CSV file of a recent dump of all our support requests, categorize them into these seven use cases. And it can do it. Mm-hmm. Like it can do it. Like you're not responsible for implementing anything in scikit-learn. Like, like it just does it on its own. Um, and showing leadership, things like that feels very magical. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, and and it, it's also something that, you know, I, I don't necessarily think many people have knowledge of today that, that you can do so straightforward with large language models. Yeah, it's great. I think the average, when I say average, the, the non-data scientist person can now contribute to some yeah. degree on that level, which is, which is a beautiful thing. So along yeah. with that, how do you think, I, I know, I think you're not a big fan of predicting the future just because the shit is moving quite fast. Yeah. However, yeah. Uh, how do you think our jobs as data scientists will change next year and then the year after? Yeah, well, I, I certainly think we should start using generative AI tools. Like it's, and, and if you don't, you're, you know, it, it's just like, it's just like when, um, you know, in the before times, everybody was using SPSS and SAS, and then you know the rest of the world started using open source R and Python. Um, like you're you're gonna get left behind if you if you don't start you know like at least exploring with this stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, but I also think that a lot of the the things that were huge bummers about being data scientists, like figuring out how to have the right pan- pandas incantations, or um, like doing uh doing the this sort of really kludgy data pre-processing steps all of those are and like spending five hours trying to make one plat, map plot live visualization like all of those things are going to go away um and uh which is great like that is awesome that is that is candidly one of the coolest things in the entire world um because just as i mentioned you could ask the large language model to do classification and of course you have to check its work like make sure yeah. that it just like a grad student, like make sure it did the right thing. Um, you can also say like, hey, uh, hey, large language model, here's a whole bunch of unstructured data or a whole bunch of data that is not like styled in the convention that I want. It's not in the correct date time format. Could you please get it into the right date time format? Um, and it will do that. Uh, so, so it's, but, but again, like that's taking away the tedious part. Mm-hmm. Like that's the part that I would want to just like, pay somebody on Fiverr to do for me yep. as opposed to like meaningful to my actual work. Um, have you heard of, so you've heard of SGD, so stochastic gradient descent. Have you heard of GSD? Yep. GSD. I, I have heard of it, but I don't think that I am. This is my joke. Expert. This is my joke. It's graduate student oh. descent. So they find, oh, they right. go find the best parameters for you to. Oh, cool. <laughs> like, it's excellent. The, so, so graduate student descent is makes makes a lot of sense to me. I also remember in the earth sciences when I was um, when I was in school, so many of the tasks were just like, all right, well, go like here's a picture, go count the number of things in the picture. I think biology is very similar. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so again, like any of that that we can take away from you know, poor grad students having a terrible time. I think that is our responsibility as engineers to do. Yes. Okay. What should investors be looking, be thinking about when investing in Gen AI companies? That's a very, I feel it's just like a very stormy set of waters for them. Yeah. Certainly not GitHub stars. (laughs) <laughs> like it's which which seems which seems to be what most people are looking at these days, hmm. which is super weird. Oh, yeah, okay, like there, there are venture capital firms. Yeah, there are venture capital firms that are like, oh well, GitHub stars proxies for like how how much people like these things. When the reality is, you could pay like five bucks and then get like five thousand fake GitHub stars. Um, yeah. So so my recommendation is. Um, don't focus on the size of the team. What we're seeing continually is that a small number of people can do really meaningful work. Mm -hmm. Focus on people who are passionate and have a small set, like big, like maybe a big mission statement, like, uh, like something, something like, uh, you know, uh, deliver the most responsible machine learning systems or, um, you know, unlock potential of, of generative AI for scientists or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Um, but that they're small, starting small. They have like well-scoped project, a small number of highly focused, very passionate, very solid, strong engineers. 
Um, don't worry too awful much if they don't necessarily have support people yet. So like product people or um, any of those things. I feel like there are a large number of engineers are um, kind of already product focused or they're building product intuition very quickly. And that's mm -hmm. enabled by generative AI tools. Um, yeah. And then also um, I would not bet on like we have a really capable set of companies that are working on large language models today. So we've got like Facebook, Google, OpenAI, Anthropic, you know, we've got uh, all of these teams that are, that are focused on building the, the large generative platforms. Don't worry about that too awful much. Focus on the people that have interest in domain fine tuning, like instruction tuning, clear problem that they have like a, a nice roadmap of step-by-step -step stones on the way to their much bigger mission. Um, and I've always been a fan of like investing in people mm -hmm. as opposed to investing in just like some arbitrary other thing. Cause if you, if you do find people who are passionate about what they do, who care very deeply, um, like that's, they're going to do great things regardless. Yes. It might not be the great thing that they written on paper day zero, but they're going to do awesome things. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. So I have a theory that the average size of the firm will either stay the same or shrink just because of all of the productivity gains. And I think you'll end up seeing folks get larger exits with smaller company size. Cause you know, I've been in the startup space and it, it's kind of tough to see you bring a bunch of people in to push you on this mission. You don't gain the revenue. You fire all these people and their lives are disrupted. So I'm, I'm yeah. very excited to see this, these small, strong, powerful teams just, I don't want to say dominate the market. They find their own space and, and they build a, a long-term viable business. I think it'll be cool. Yeah, I agree. And it's, it's also a massive communications and organizational overhead. The more people you add to a company, um, just because, you know, it's, it's harder for everyone to, you know, once you move past, what is it like two pizza parties? Yes. Um, the, the, it's more challenging to know what people are working on to help folks feel connected, to make sure there's not redundancy. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and there's something magical about working as part of a small team, you know, like it, it's, you know, you feel very close to each other. Um, you feel like you have like a, a, a mission. Um, so, so it's, it's just good. Yeah. And I, I think a lot less people will get fired in the whole startup yeah. cycle, which I don't know. Yeah. I, that's something that people don't really maybe speak about a lot is the, the harsh part about innovation is people's lives getting disrupted from them just getting yes. axed. Um, and that's, that's always a yeah. sad thing. And, and these are great people. Mm -hmm. Like there, there have been so many instances. I, I've heard just recently of three founders of like multi unicorn or like multi billion dollar startups that um, had early examples in their career where they were laid off from a startup, oh. and not for reasons for performance, not for anything, just because like it was the growth and then drop phase. Yeah, that burn rate, that burn rate will get you. Yeah. Um, yeah. You had mentioned in a podcast, I think it was learning from machine learning. That was a, that was a good interview. Uh, how will academia, academia change with all the Gen AI stuff? You had mentioned that people are not writing as much papers anymore, which to some yeah. degree I think is a beautiful thing because sometimes papers, yeah. like I've spent three years working on a single paper and I can't get those years back. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. So yeah. what's your thoughts there? I, I think that academia will be transformed just as all of the academic disciplines were transformed when we saw, you know, calculus statistics start to get introduced. Um, I think that we, we're already seeing the earth sciences, the social sciences, the physical sciences start to incorporate more generative AI into their, uh, into their process of doing research. Um, and increasingly though, I, I, and, and maybe this is, um, like, certainly this is probably going to be a contentious statement. Mm -hmm. um, I like that. Go I, for it. Yeah. Oh God. It's, I, so, so I love learning. Like I, I absolutely, uh, like learning is my, my favorite thing. Like I always choose roles, choose companies based on how much I feel like I can learn. Mm -hmm. Um, but I, it also is, 
especially since the pandemic, I think we're seeing a lot of students choose online, more personalized curriculum approaches as opposed to going to more formal universities. Mm-hmm. Um not just for undergrad, but also for grad school, because because often you can learn, you know, just as much as you might in grad school, just in, in the workplace, probably more. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. And so so I think if universities do not figure out how to incorporate Gen AI features and also figure out what their place is, given that, that people are wanting to learn in a more on the job sort of way, um, then then they're, they're going to, to not be the, the, the kinds of institutions that they had been previously. I really admire university of Waterloo for this. Hmm. Um, like, have you, have you heard of university of Waterloo? Um, yeah, I know. Of Univers- I actually know a professor there. Um, so Excellent. what are they, yeah. what are they doing differently? So, so what they do and there's, uh, many, like just thinking, reflecting on it, like a lot of, friends went to University of Waterloo, like Bart Traz, um, who's currently in DeepMind, Tristan Hume, who's currently in Anthropic. Um, but what the, what the process looks like is like you have a semester or so of instruction. Mm-hmm. So like you're, you're learning stuff, you're going to school and then you have like internship. So it's mm-hmm. like four to they five months. They push you right and, into that. Yeah. And, and so it's, and it's not just like one internship. It's like, many, many internships mm. over the course of your academic career. And it's always like, go to school, go to internship, go to school, go to internship, okay. go to school, go to internship. So you're immediately applying it. That's very cool. Um, and, yeah. And it helps not just for, you know, like the kids get money for the, to pay for their academic tuition, um, to pay for like co- cost of living expenses when they go back to school, but you also build such an understanding of, okay, well, here are the things that I'm learning and here's what businesses actually need. Yes. And so um, I, I, I feel yeah. like the more of that that we see in the education space, the the healthier it will be. And here's me doing state-of-the-art data science on a crappy laptop that I was supposed yeah. to, that I was hired to do. That's, that's always fun. Well, <laughs> if, if it's a Mac, if it's a Mac, those, the, the chips in the Macs are getting pretty impressive, they I have are. to say. They are. Yeah. Lots of yeah. legacy companies yet using no Mac. I, I worked in the railroad industry when I first started, so that was, oh, oh, cool. <laughs> that was as painful I as it could be. Yeah, I worked at Chevron, and Chevron was also using, I remember my Lenovo laptop, <laughs> which was super, super clunky. Yep. Um, I, I think they're still using those, but we'll see. <laughs> All right. I have a funny question. What advice do you have for Web3 influencers? Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Uh, aren't they all, aren't they all Gen AI influencers? No, oh, they, like, they uh, are. Uh, yeah. But it's, uh, so, so I, and, and that, they not, like, don't want to be mean, like, but, the, but, but I, I will say, you know, the, the industry does change all the time. Mm-hmm. And so, so the, um, I, I think that, you know, one of the, one of the best things that we can do as professionals is to try out new technologies as they arise, um, uh, build an understanding as to whether they're solving a real problem versus, you know, something that's like a, a technology looking for a problem. Mm-hmm. Um, and we're all going to make, uh, we're all going to think that something's going to take off and then see it either take off five years later or not take off at all. And so, so, you know, there, there are a lot of people who, uh, or take off for a while and then not take off like silver light being a good example of this, mm. right? Like it was, it was all, all that you could see for a while and then not so much. Um, but that's how we learn. That's how we grow. You try things, you try other things, and then you, you change your position. Um, and even if you invested a lot of time or energy into learning something, you should never feel like it's a mistake to, to kind of pivot and to explore something new. Yeah. I, I asked that question um, funnily one, cause I heard you sit on an interview and two, I actually tried to, so I had launched like a YouTube channel for NFTs. Like yeah. I had gone pretty hard into it. Oh, wow. Whoa. I did not know that. Yeah. yeah. So that picture behind me, I actually commissioned a friend. <laughs> so it's like a robotic whale and it, it's supposed to signify like, um, like, you know, a whale in crypto is the one that controls a lot of things. And so I'd sort of figured mm-hmm. out in the NFT space that the, the influencers were the ones that really made the money. 
because mm. they got early access to all the NFTs and then they sold them at base price to everyone else. So you saw that market and you saw that if you had a following, you were able to get in a lot on a lot of those projects. But then I just realized like, okay, if a high schooler could do this, this makes no sense for me to be doing it. I should go do something way more difficult and spend my time more wisely. So, but it was a good, it was a good experience. I actually learned to launch YouTube channels and that's what kind of got me into podcasting and stuff as well. So it was one of those cool. sidebar lessons I had to go learn. So, so I also, though, when I originally, when, when I had first heard of NFTs, my first thought about them was, uh, you know, I had a lot of friends, still do have a lot of friends who are artists. Um, so they were either musicians or they were people who created like paintings or, or things that are similar. Um, and my first thought was just like, well, thank God, like now mm -hmm. artists can get rewarded for digital asset creation. Um, but then I started poking a little bit more. Um, and it, and it felt a little bit different cause it was like rapid, rapid, like trading, um, yes. of, of some of these things. Um, but, but the initial premise of like being able to reward digital art creators with, um, you know, with some sort of compensation when it feels like so often their work just gets like copy pasted, it's changed and then like not, no attribution given whatsoever. Mm -hmm. Um, we need we need to find some way to to make that a reality yes. of you know like some sort of digital watermarking. I don't know what it is. I am not gifted in this space, but some way of making sure that people get recognized for the great work that they do. Yeah, completely aligned. I I think the thing that initially attracted me was the compounding revenue. So if you had mm -hmm. a, a certain percentage, all the percentage of the follow on sales naturally came to you because it was on contract. So that I, I always I thought that was kind of cool. Like every time someone resold your artwork, you got a cut of it. And that, that was a beautiful vision, but <laughs> here we are. Um, do you have a, a couple more minutes? I, I know we were yep. scheduled. Okay, cool. Definitely. All right. I wanted to shift into career and advice. And I think when I first learned about you, I actually interviewed on your team, I think in like 2017, when you're at Microsoft as a developer advocate, that was the first time I heard about yeah. that role. I was like, oh, that's yeah. like the dream role. Um, so you've worked at Microsoft, you've worked at Google, you've worked at GitHub. Uh, what's your career optimization function and how has it changed yeah. over time? Yeah, so, so my career optimization function might be a little bit different. So, and so your mileage, like everybody's mileage may vary. Um, I always like to go where I feel like I will learn the most. So go to the company that is doing the thing that you want to learn how to do the best mm -hmm. if you can. Um, and then also in the data science and machine learning space, go where the data is like the, the oil and gas industry being an example um, if you want to, uh, at the time I was really passionate about, uh, you know, model building for earth sciences, um, and still am honestly, but, uh, but there, there's so much potential other than just earth science. Um, but the only companies that have those data, the seismic assets, the well logs, like all of mm -hmm. these things are oil and gas companies. Um, but if you, if you go to where you'll learn the most, where, uh, where the data is. And then also, you know, at the end of the day, the most important thing is the people that you're working with, um, where, you know, you really enjoy the company of the people there. Um, then you're always going to have a good time. Like there will, there will be no, uh, there will be no regrets, or at least I have not found there to be any regrets. Yes. Um, the regrets come when you feel like you're stagnating and when you don't enjoy going into the office every day and seeing folks, hmm. um, how come you didn't stay in like the IC track? So it's because you saw, hey, I wanted to learn something new. This company was doing it that you didn't maybe become like a level five, you know, staff data scientist at X company. Is that, is that a fair statement? Yeah. Well, and, and also, um, so I was, uh, I was an engineer for, for a long while. Like when, when you join Google, I'm not sure if this is still the case, but when you when you join Google as a doing DevRel, so developer programs engineering or developer advocacy, you have to go through the SWE interview, which is pretty mm. cool. Um, or at least that was that was the way it was back in the day. Um, maybe different now, um, but I, oftentimes I find that 
the decisions when you have these larger companies about what SWEs are going to build, um, they don't get made by the SWEs themselves. They get made by like these director plus meeting type decisions. Um, and the director plus engineers are there, um, but also the product managers. Um, mm-hmm. And so, so if you want to influence to make sure that the right things are being built, both for users as well as the right features so that, you know, if you're a software engineer, you're not spending the majority of your time creating something that will never see the light of day or never see traction, then then you need to be in the room when the decisions made. Makes sense. And yeah. And so so that was that was my primary motivation of switching to product is I wanted to make sure that we were building the right things for users, that we were making the right decisions to respect SWEs on their time. And that was the clearest path towards it. Hmm. What's your advice for switching from a data scientist, software engineer to product management? You've already got great experience for it. And the, you know, a big part of PM, or at least the way that I think about PM is bringing data. Hmm. So using data to justify decisions, being very user focused, being very technical. Um, Some other people have, have different philosophies towards product. Um, but, but this, this aspect of, um, especially if you're a product lead for, uh, highly technical things. So like a machine learning framework, a a library, um, an API, like being the best and most, uh, kind of experienced user of said product is, is part of the job description. Hmm. Um, so, so being technical, having a lot of passion around data will do nothing but benefit you in the world of product. So you still get to do as much hands-on things, even though I know you're yeah. okay. I, I program, I program every day. Like yesterday I had, um, as an example, yesterday I had open a collab notebook where I was testing out one of our internal code models on um, a question about uh, a question about merging two graphs hmm. um, and and trying to see uh, whether that had a, a better answer than a couple of other variants that we had that weren't um, fine-tuned on internal data very cool so so it's like like yeah so so it's like every single day like every single day is is still getting to program which is delightful and aided with gen ai now right i imagine yep aided with gen ai <laughs> So, so it's, it's getting even easier, which is, which is awesome. And it, and that's, that's really, uh, exhilarating as well, um, to, to be building tools that you get to use yourself. Yeah. Oh yeah. That must be interesting because mm-hmm. yeah, you have to then test it before it goes off. Um, yeah. slightly weird question. You answered some of it. Um, but I'll ask it again. What's your criteria for changing to another job? I know you answered a, a portion of that and what's your style of saying yeah. goodbye? Yeah. So, so changing to another job, I I feel like if you, if I, if I, if I am not growing technically, Mm -hmm. um, then that's, that's usually a smoke signal. Um, and then also if there's a change in, uh, sort of expectations, like there's, there's been an example of, um, uh, like at, at one point there was an example of a reorg kind of happening spontaneously mm-hmm. um, or very quickly. And the, the role description suddenly changing dramatically. So either not continuing to work on the, on the thing that brings me joy or feeling like I could learn or, um, uh, and both of these have happened, uh, a complete change in like the latter profile description. Mm-hmm. Um, so like suddenly being technical isn't celebrated, like being more kind of secretarial or like managing decks is celebrated. Mm-hmm. Um, neither of which bring me joy. Um, and, and so, so those, those pieces are usually indications to me that I should, do something else. Start. And if you feel like you're not growing, then like that's, that's probably not going to change unless you swap teams. Mm-hmm. Um, and if you feel like your manager doesn't value your contributions, you're probably not going to change your manager's mind. Yeah. Um, I, I, so, um, s- those are, those are two aspects. And then style of saying goodbye. Um, I don't think we ever really say goodbye. Right. Like, mm. cause the, cause the, uh, this community is so dang small. Like I still talk to there, there are some team members who I had at GitHub that I still talk to every week or every couple of weeks. Oh, that's cool. Um, 
Yeah. There are team members I had at Microsoft that, you know, like I see on Facebook every single day or Twitter every single day um, and feel like I, I know more about their lives than, than my family probably knows about mine. Unfortunately, it's like, and uh, even spending like holidays with them, like going to uh, my first boss at Chevron, Coach Bob, um, I, every time I go to new Orleans, like I go and stay with him and his family or go and try to see him and his family. That's nice. Um, yeah. So it's like, I, I don't, I don't think we ever really say goodbye. And then there are so often like people who you work with, who you really love working with that just naturally gravitate to the same company. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's always beautiful to see too. Cool. Yeah. That was a beautiful, that's a beautiful answer. Well, how many papers you yeah. read a day? How many papers do I read yeah. a day? So, so that's a, that's a much harder question. I, I don't think I read a paper every day. Mm -hmm. I definitely read blog, multiple blog posts every day. Okay. Um, the, uh, I read, I would say probably on average, like four or five papers a week. Okay. Um, but I've been trying more this. towards four. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah have been trending more towards for and, and I skim abstracts like religiously. Like it mm -hmm. feels like there, there are new papers that come out regularly. So, so just being able to quickly skim the abstract and look at a couple of figures is important. Very cool. So you're very active on yeah. Twitter. Um, how do you yeah. mean, how do you maintain a longer context attention span given that Twitter is very, you know, short attention span? How do you balance that as yeah. in your learning? Usually I, yeah, usually I look at, so, so during meetings, I am like present in meetings. Um, when I walk from one meeting to another is usually when I'm looking okay. through Twitter or looking at emails, um, or in transit from my house to, um, to where the company sits. So I try to use the gap time as efficiently as possible, either through looking at emails, looking at Twitter, um, kind of scrolling through the machine learning Twitter section, or um, reading a book, uh, hmm. and those those gap fillers uh, have been have been really useful because you can't really do like focused work. Like I like if I pull out my laptop on a shuttle, then I'm going to have to put it away ten minutes later. Yeah. Um. But you can do the the lower attention focus things. Makes sense. Okay. Yeah. Um, what do you think separates the top one percent of data scientists from another? Who can ask the best questions? Ooh. Like, like that's the that's the 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 thing. Like, it doesn't matter. You know, increasingly we're seeing that technical skill sets are things that can be augmented with Gen AI tools. Um, but you know, being able to ask really insightful questions and to constantly think about what we aren't seeing in the data or what additional data sources we need to capture. Hmm. That is the that is the uniquely human thing that that I think separates the best data scientists and the best product leads to, honestly. I would not have thought that would have been the answer, by the way. That's okay. a cool answer. I, it's, I, it's, but yeah, asking the best questions. Okay. Uh, just a couple more questions. What do you tell yourself when you start feeling the imposter syndrome set in? Oh, uh, so, so that still happens every single day. Okay. Like the, every single day it's just, um, I, and it's happened all my career, I don't anticipate it ever to go away, honestly, mm. like this, this feeling generally of like, um, you know, you're good and not good enough. You shouldn't be. That sort of thing. Um, I, it's just that over time, I don't think it's that the voice gets quieter. It's just that you don't have as much time to listen to it. Mm. Um, because you're, you're too busy doing other things. Makes and sense. so, so there are instances where, um, you know, there's like a quiet period and, and it's suddenly like, you know, wow, like you're, you know, like the, the voice comes out again. And then it's just an indication to me of like, well, better go and like get started doing something else. Good. Stay um, busy. Yeah. Okay, yeah, like, stay busy. That's a good one. All right. So your gift is defined as something that comes easy to you and is difficult to others. What would you say is your gift? Like is coding very easy for you? Like you just Oh no, not all the, uh, I, I enjoy doing it. Okay. I enjoy doing it, but it's, but it's certainly not easy. Like still, still tricky to debug though. It feels a little bit like puzzles. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, uh, I, I think something that comes easy to, I grew up in a very small town. Um, so super, super small. Um, which means that 
and, and everybody in Texas, like conversation is important. Like, like, and that also feels like a, a thing that's, that's important in like the South and the U S just regardless. Um, so, so something that, that feels easy for me to do is, is to just have a conversation with somebody. Like mm-hmm. if you're, if you're sitting next to somebody on a bus, like doesn't matter who that person is, you should be able to like find some commonality that you can talk to this person about for five minutes. Like, like that's, that's just a thing. Yes. Like, and so, um, so that, that feels easy for me. I think other people might struggle with that. Um, hmm. Well, are you on, if we looked at a spectrum of introversion versus extroversion, I'm not a big fan of labels, but which, mm-hmm. which side of the spectrum do you veer towards? Definitely introvert. <laughs> really? Um, okay. Like the, yeah, yeah. Like the, the energy comes from being, being alone, kind of doing, doing work, reading mm-hmm. those sorts of things. Um, but I also, I was also one of those people and I would love to get your perspective on this too. I was one of those people that when the pandemic hit, it hit hard mm-hmm. um, in the sense that the, you know, the community at work was something that, that really drew me to Google brain. Yes. And not having that was just, it felt, it felt like a huge piece of my life was gone. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and so, so I really, really love going into the office every day, getting to see people, getting to, to learn a little bit more about themselves, about their families. Yes. Um, and, and that's, that's something that, that I can't give up. So I, I, but that doesn't make me an extrovert. I don't think hmm. it's just that I, I really love people. And so like, yeah, I think as I'm getting older, I'm becoming more introverted over time. I think as yeah. I was younger, yeah. I was hardcore extrovert and I've, yeah. the more time I spend with folks on, on the other side of the spectrum, I learn how energizing it actually is and how much, of your deep creative work comes out of that um, yep. sitting alone and allowing your mind to, to come to a new place. Huh. Exactly. And, but I, but I think the, the time that you spent kind of getting to know people, getting to, to know how to talk to them um, is incredibly valuable for data science as well, because it helps you become a better communicator. Mm-hmm. It helps you understand a broad, diverse, like, swath of things that people might be interested in. Yes. Um, so, so benefits of both pieces. Okay. Um, what are three books you recommend folks read? Yep. So three books, that's hard. Three books. I know it's always tough to choose, um, to choose three. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I really love, um, and though this is almost a cliche, the diamond age by Neil Stevenson, hmm. um, which is a fiction book. It's, uh, like something that, that I think a lot of people are really jazzed about the potential of actually happening, Mm -hmm. um, given gen AI tools. Um, I also really, really recommend, and let me look this up for you. Uh, a book that I, that I adored as a child, um, called the way things work, um, by, by Neil McCauley or, or David, David McCauley rather. Um, let me send this as well. I'll put it, yep. I'll put it in the chat. The way things um, work. I haven't heard that one before. The way things work. Yeah, it's it's like a picture book, but it's uh, for each each page of the book. It tells you how how a different physical system or a different tool works. So it might be like how does your keyboard on your computer work, or it might be how do seat belts work, or it might be um, how do ceiling fans work, or like any of these. Do other you ever things. watch that show? How things work on Discovery Channel. Yes. Oh, I love that yes, show. Yes, yes. That was my favorite show yep. on the planet. Yeah. And you would love this book then. Okay. Um, so, so that one, the diamond age. And, um, I also really, really enjoy, um, dealers of lightning, what? which is about the early days of Xerox park. Dealers um, of lightning. Hmm. Dealers of lightning. Yeah. And that's a, I, I especially love reading about early tech history. Mm-hmm. Um, because there, there are so many companies that, you know, maybe weren't on paper super successful, um, but they inspired so many people, so many great ideas, um, and ended up transforming the entire industry. 
Um, so, so Xerox Park being one of those. Um, and then uh, there was another company called General Magic, um, which uh, which has a beautiful documentary. Um, but they they were basically trying to build the iPhone before the iPhone existed, mm. um, and uh, they were doing it too early. But but everybody who worked there ended up um, like Tony Fidel, as an example, ended up going and like creating the iPod and creating Nest that got acquired by Google. Um, and then there were some other people that ended up being like the CTO for Barack Obama. Wow. Um, and yeah, or uh, or or people that that ended up going to Apple or founding YouTube or being one of the like the the paper. Like it's just awesome, awesome group of people. And they wouldn't have done the great things that they did afterwards if they hadn't worked at General Magic, even though most people have never heard of it. Um, that's, that's a good perspective. Oh, very cool. Yeah. Uh, what are three things you do daily to ensure progress, that you make progress? Three things I do daily. Definitely coffee. <laughs> um, the the uh, So certainly coffee. I also walk quite a bit ah, each day. So I try to okay. average over 20,000 steps. Very cool. Um, uh, and try to do, which which is a little bit of a workout. Um, I also try to uh, work out at least once a week in a, in a harder, mm -hmm. like more than just walking 20,000 steps. Um, and then also, um, I think it's useful to, to count, um, to count blessings yeah. each day. Um, so, so like, uh, there's, there's, uh, an approach towards things that you're grateful for, things that you're looking forward to. Um, and then also things that you learn each day in ways that you unblock each other. Hmm. Um, so like unblocking other people. Yes. Um, but, but making, just getting principled about what are the things that you value? Um, and then just like documenting them every single day. Oh, so you write a lot. You at least put some thoughts on paper. Yeah, right just right. and those are like that it almost feels embarrassing to call that writing but it's just kind of like jotting down like things that i'm grateful for mm -hmm. things that i've learned ways that i've unblocked other people um those sorts of things very cool so i have three questions uh, yeah. i know you, you gotta run um yeah okay so you're stuck on an island so you have a specialized uh -huh. chef who could only cook two meals what would you choose uh only cook two meals so I really love, uh, I really love borscht, uh, like a soup that's made out of beets, um, and, and a whole bunch of other things. Sometimes there's lamb, but I, I really, really love borscht. Okay. Um, and I also, uh, I really, really love scrambled eggs. So like if I could have borscht and scrambled eggs, I would probably be a happy person. I think you, um, you reignited my passion for scrambled eggs. Like I, I know I like scrambled eggs a lot, but I've never heard yeah. a single human ever say that. So I'm like, yeah. oh yeah, they are quite good. Breakfast food is awesome. <laughs> like breakfast food is amazing. Um, and, uh, but, but I also, you know, I, I, I'm not, I appreciate really good food. Mm -hmm. Um, so I appreciate like the foodie style things. Um, but there, there's also just something really, really comforting about, uh, about home cooked food that that's simple, but, but just delicious. And oh, yeah. usually borscht is kind of like gumbo and that everybody oh, has their own okay. recipe. I see. And so it can be different. Uh, it can be different each time you try it. Makes sense. Um, last two questions. Yeah. What's one piece of advice you have for a high schooler, a mm -hmm. person in college and a professional? Cool, cool. So high schooler, the world is your oyster. Like there has never been a better time to, to kind of have an idea, get it out into the world and get it immediately seen by, you know, like on the order of millions of people, if you want. Mm -hmm. um, so, so like the, I remember when I was growing up in high school, it felt like the most isolated ding thing. Um, like dial up internet was the state of the art. Like, so, so you have so much potential, uh, like definitely learn how to use gen AI tools. Definitely like, don't feel limited by it, by like your age or wherever you're happening to live, um, for college students, um, don't feel like you have to stay in college. Don't feel like you have to go to grad school or follow some yeah. like set path that maybe your parents followed. Don't feel like standardized tests are important. Like what's really important is having an idea, doing something with it and, and trying to, to make a positive impact on the world. And then for professionals, like 
there are a whole bunch of things out there that exist today that did not exist two years ago. And so, so the best bet that any of us can do is just try them out. Um, I, you know, try to, to build an intuition about how they work and not get too emotionally attached to any process that we're currently following because chances are it'll look different in three years. Hmm. Um, so, so for professionals, the best thing that anybody can do is just continue to learn. Um, and, and to, to have the expectation that learning is going to be like, learning is going to be the thing that makes people successful versus not like how quickly can you learn? How quickly can you adopt new technologies and techniques? Um, and then also how, how capable and resilient you are to change. Makes sense. Last question. What do you want people to remember about you? I would be okay with not being remembered. Hmm. Like there's, uh, there's the, um, I, so I bring up Xerox Park again. There's this guy named Bob Taylor, mm-hmm. um, who, uh, who is awesome by the way, like Bob Taylor grew up, grew up small town, Texas. He was adopted. Um, I went to school, like did, did some research and kind of cognitive sciences type things, ended up going to work for the government, um, was the person who funded like ARPANET, I think, and ALOHANET. So, so wow. like made sure that the internet could happen. Um, did not stop there. Went to Xerox Park, um, funded all of the research programs for Xerox Park, which led to like the GUI, the object oriented programming languages, like Smalltalk, um, graphical user interfaces, uh, like uh, hooking up machines all together. Um, all sorts of advances that uh, that made the modern world like like Steve Jobs and Bill Gates like s- took most of what they needed for Windows and the Mac uh, from, from his Xerox. from his stuff yeah yeah hmm. and so he was the one that was able to advocate for the funding to support all of that great research that was done Small Talk created by you know Alan Kay Adele Goldberg um, inspired so many researchers to to build their additional languages including like. Um, even like some of the VS code team was inspired by small talk and by squeak. Wow. Um, yeah, uh, uh, Alan Kay created the Dynabook, which was more or less the, the iPad before the iPad existed. So all of this stuff happened because of Bob Taylor. Nobody knows who Bob Taylor is. Like the internet exists, the entire, like all of the stuff that we see out in the world today, it exists because of Bob Taylor. Nobody knows who's like, it's like he exists through his work. So, That's beautiful. so. Yeah, like I would, I would love to be that person. Very cool. It makes that last question makes a lot more sense as to to what drives you. And um, I just wanted to say thank you for spending the time with me on on the interview and and sharing your journey and and your knowledge. I appreciate it. Cool. Thank you. This has been super fun. Mm-hmm.